Well, hi there, everyone. My name is Scott Nicholson, and I'm a professor of game design and development at Wilfrid Laurier University in Brantford, Ontario, Canada. And I'm going to be talking about how to create a game for the Escape If game system that I developed. Escape If is a game system designed to help teachers in low resource classrooms or any classrooms create a cooperative storytelling game. Now, if you haven't seen Escape If before, this is not the best place to start because I'm not going to be going any more into detail about Escape If. You can find videos and more information about what Escape If is over at escapeif.com. So my suggestion is if you don't know about Escape If, stop this video now. Go to escapeif.com, watch the videos there, explore the sample games, get an idea of what it is, because I'm going to be focusing here on how to make Escape If games. Many of the resources that I'll be using throughout this are linked to escapeif.com. If you go to escapeif.com in the top right corner, you're going to see a link that says class resources, and that is going to take you to a set of resources that are designed to help you when you're creating Escape If games. There are two versions of this video. The version that you're watching right now is the shorter version. Now in this shorter version, I go through the concepts, but you should have the worksheet that you can find at escapeif.com open and available. And after I talk about each section of the worksheet, then you should pause the video and work on your own game using the worksheet. It's designed to be interactive in that way. If you would like to see a, an example of an Escape If game, you'll then want to watch the other version, the longer version of this video, which you will find at escapeif.com in the class resources link. So what is Escape If? Very broadly, it's a cooperative storytelling game. The escape word comes from escape room design concepts, and the if comes from interactive fiction design concepts. During these games, there's gonna be two main things we do. We have choices and we have challenges. And those choices, the students will work in small groups. Uh, they will just talk about a choice and then everyone will vote on which choice they would like. And then the teacher will go to a different place in the Escape If script and continue reading the game. Challenges are kind of like problems in traditional classrooms. The students will work in small groups to solve the problems, but the problems will be set within the larger story world. What we're doing here is based around specific learning outcomes, but you can choose whether you're going to use an Escape If game first as an introductory activity or at the end of teaching something as a reinforcement activity. Again, to learn more about Escape If, visit escapeif.com. Now the Escape If game scripts, if you haven't seen these, escapeif.com has the scripts. So the script is what the teacher reads, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today in this, in this discussion, is how to write these scripts. Now in these scripts, there's going to be some content that is bolded, and there's going to be some content that is in italics. And the idea is that the teacher should read out loud the things that are bolded, and the italics are things that are instructions for the teacher. And that is a standard that you want to stay with as you write it so that if uh, someone reads one of your scripts, they'll know what to do with things. But we're gonna be focusing on how to make an Escape If game script. Now I should say, what we're doing here is not only gonna help you make an Escape If game script, but it's gonna help you with writing any kind of a story, with doing any kind of a narrative-based game. The concepts all hold true. We're just gonna be applying the concepts to the Escape If game system. So the process of making a game, there's three main stages. You plan out what you're going to do. You then develop out that game, and then you test that game. Uh, and this is a cyclical process. Now, many people skip the planning, and they go straight, in, straight into trying to develop something, which is kind of like saying, I'd like to build a garage onto my house, and I'm just going to buy a bunch of wood and just go out there and just start building walls. You can build something that way, uh, but the chances that it's going to be a good garage and it's going to fit with the rest of the house are pretty low. And the same idea goes true here, that you want to spend some time planning out your game before you actually start developing that game. That's why I have this worksheet for you. The worksheet will lead you through the planning process and will help you to uh, take it step by step to have a better chance of having a good game on the other side. And then testing is a vital part of game design, but the reality is this is cyclical. You'll plan, you'll develop, you'll test what you've developed, and then sometimes it's right back to the planning phase where things didn't work out. Um, 
you'll see even during – as we talk about this process, there will be points where you go back and revisit things you've done before. So realize that making a game is not a once-and-done process. You don't do one thing and finish. You plan and develop and test and plan and develop and test and sometimes throw away half of what you made um, and go back into it. So this is the cyclical. It's an engineering process, and that's what you're doing here in game design. So you start out by thinking about who the game is for. Now, if you're a teacher, you know this because you're making it for your students. But if you're not, you want to specify who the game's designed for. A game designed for grades one through three is going to be very different than a, grade, a game designed for grades nine and ten, um, even if it's on the same learning outcome or a similar learning outcome. So you want to define up front who is this for. You also want to think about in your mind the class size. Now that's only going to come into play at one specific point later on when we talk about physical activities, but it is something you should think about up front. Choices and challenges are mostly not affected by class size because the idea is that you're going to split the class up into small groups. You're going to have the small groups talk about what's going on. You're then going to have a vote or you're going to have the groups report back on what they discovered with their challenge. So you could do it for three students and you could do it for 300 students and it's going to be the same effect. Um, but when we talk about adding a physical activity, that's where class size will matter. You want to think about what time you have available for the game. Now this lecture is going to be presented based on a game that would take one hour or so to play. Uh, that's that's the structure that I found when I've been testing the games and making the games. What you're going to see is what I've learned works well for a one hour game. But if you have more time or less time, then you will want to not use the same amount of materials that I talk about in this lecture. So this lecture is designed around making a game that's about 40 minute game because you want to reserve some of that time, 20 minutes of that time for reflection and for overhead uh, for the game. You always need that reflection part. and We'll talk about that later. You want to think about uh, how experienced are the players at gaming. Now, there's two forms of Escape If. There's Escape If and Escape If Advanced. You can find them both at escapeif.com. If your players and your teacher are more gaming experienced, then they may want to have the Escape If Advanced version, um, which is not multiple choice, but it's more open world. Rather than me saying, do you want to go left or right, I would say, you're in a room with two doors, a window, and a potted plant. What would you like to do? So that those are different ways of approaching the game, and you can find the rule sets uh, for both at escapeif.com. And then you want to think about where this game is to be used. If the game is to be used before the players have uh, engaged with a the topic, then you would need to have more training in the game. So, for example, one of the games I made was about perimeter and area. Now, if that game is to be played before the students learn about perimeter and area, then when we introduce the challenge, around perimeter, then the teacher needs to explain how they calculate perimeter. But if the class has already uh, explored perimeter, then this is being used more as an assessment tool or a reinforcement tool afterwards, then the teacher won't present that up front and they'll see, do the students actually know how to calculate perimeter? You can make games that do both. So you can create the game where you would put everything in place for it to be an introductory game, but there would be points in the text where you would tell the teacher, if the students have already learned how to calculate perimeter, then skip ahead to paragraph seven, and they would skip a section. So you can do games that do both. If you do that, you need to have the introductory concepts in there, but make them so they can be skipped. Kind of like regular video games. There's that skip button, so you want to build in your skip button. Now you want to think about the learning outcomes. So the learning outcomes in game design when you're making a learning game are your lighthouse. It is the thing to which you're always looking at with every decision you make. Whenever you make a choice, you say, does this choice take our game closer or further away from our learning outcomes? And that helps you decide what to do. And that's the difference between making a learning game and a recreational game. But in that learning game, you're always coming back to, does this take us closer to the learning outcomes? Now, for an Escape If game, the best learning outcomes are those that are specific and applicable to the real world. If your learning outcome is not applicable to the real world, I do not recommend making an Escape If game around it because you will have a very superficial game. Now, sure, you could have a story that says, I have captured you in my dungeon and you shall have to solve my linear algebra problems to escape. 
You could do that, but that's a bad educational game, and we're trying not to make bad educational games. So I would say, well, what are the real-world applications of linear algebra, and how do you build that into the game? And if your answer back to me is, I don't know, then I would say, well, then don't use escape if. Don't spend the time and effort to make a storytelling game where you're going to situate activities in the real world if you don't have any real-world applications for your learning outcome. Now, it can be useful to look at a proficiency framework. So the global proficiency framework is available for uh, math and for reading concepts between grades one and nine. Um, and these give you very nice specific learning outcomes that can be useful when you're making your game. I've got some examples on there. I've used these learning outcomes that you see on the screen right now for a game around feeding dinosaurs. And so the idea was that the players need to figure out how to add and subtract fractions, whole numbers, mixed numbers, and those learning outcomes are very specific. So my suggestion is to think specifically about what you're going to be teaching with the game. So the next thing, now that you know your learning outcomes and you've thought about the real world application of learning outcomes, is to start to think about the story world. Now the story world is the space in which your game is set. And you want to think where it could be. And I like to do this with a systematic brainstorm where I take each application for the learning outcome in the real world and I use it to think about different settings. I'll think about, well, what are the real world settings where this, this learning outcome could make sense? What are the historical settings? Are there places in history where we could look at a historical application of the real world? And this is where you can start to think about what's going to excite your learners. Or are there other topics in the curriculum that they're learning at the same time? So if they're learning about the Roman times, then you may want to think, well, do I have a way to apply this to what they're learning in this other class? Or there's the fantasy world. Now, fantasy is not just swords and sorcery, high fantasy. Fantasy refers to anything that's sort of made up. Um, but thinking about are there futuristic settings? Are there past? Is it the caveman settings? Are we doing it there? Um, what is the fantasy world in which this could make sense? And I like to think about how we can add some playfulness to what's going on here. So, for example, um, uh, you could, with the fractions game, I thought, well, I could do a game about feeding animals the correct ratios of food. Um, but if I want to be playful with it and have some fun, I could think about, well, what if they're zoo animals? That might be exciting. And even more playful, I think, well, what if they're dinosaurs? I mean, that's even more exciting. So you want to think about how do you make things playful? Because if it's playful, the students will engage with it. And the goal is that after the game is over, the players should be able to connect the game setting to the real world settings. So if you did something with feeding dinosaurs food, then you could have the students reflect and say, now, where else might you use this concept? And it's like in cooking, you know, that's a real world setting. One of the things that happens with the story world that can get exciting is that if you are creating a series of games over a semester, you can use the same story world and make it more and more rich and get the students more and more involved. And that's where, for example, I use the dinosaur safari story world for quite a few of my sample games because the dinosaur safari world gives the students a lot of uh, excitement. They're raising dinosaurs. They begin to fulfill their role. They understand it. They understand what they're going to be doing. And there's a lot of affordances that it gives me as a designer. And I'll use that term throughout this, the term of affordances. Affordances are those things in your story world or your environment that you as a puzzle creator or a challenge creator can use to create your challenges and make them make sense. So in a dinosaur safari, you've got dinosaurs, you've got your customers, you've got feeding, you've got budgeting, you've got a lot of stuff to work with. Um, but you wouldn't have, say, a laser maze or something like that that wouldn't make a lot of sense. So you want to think about a story world that's going to give you the affordances, the, the, the things, the palette that you're going to create your game out of. It can be really neat as the semester goes on to continue to revisit the story world, to develop characters, and then at the end of the semester, have the students create their own chapters in the story. Because by that point, they'll understand the story world. They'll be excited about it. And then you say, well, what happens next? And challenge the students to make their own Escape If game based on the story world. And you could even share these videos with them in order to get them going. The next step is to think about the genre of your game. So a genre is a, a shortcut for you 
It allows you to make choices about your story and your story world um, and allows you to be consistent in those choices. It also helps the players to already have some comfort in what they're going to be doing if you've picked a genre that, that they know. So if this were a movie or a TV show or a book, what kind would it be? So here are some of the some of the typical escape room genres that might be useful for you to consider. These are just a short list. There are many other genres, but this can at least get you thinking. So you want to think about an adventure. Um, so is the player exploring the unknown? Is it a mystery? Are you exploring a situation to solve a problem? Is it espionage? Are you sneaking around and monitoring what's going on and making a plan to try and accomplish a goal? Is it recovery? Is something missing and you're going to retrieve it? Uh, is it survival? You've been put in a bad situation and you just need to survive or escape. Um, is it a science game? Are you doing research about a situation, making decisions and creating solutions to, to resolve a problem? Or a nurturing game where there's someone else that has some needs or something else that has needs and you are trying to take care of them. And you want to think about as you're choosing the genre, you want to think about who the player is in that world. So when we do game design, we talk about the idea of roles and goals. So roles is who is the player and goals is what are they trying to accomplish? I find it useful at this point to think about what you've brainstormed and combine it with each of these. So think about your settings that you thought about previously and combine it to figure out what's a good combination. So let's say we decided that a dentist's office would be a good place for a story world. So if we were to think about each one of these to say, well, where does it fit with a dentist's office? Who is the player in an adventure set in a dentist's office. Well, it could be that the player is a, a dentist and one of the patients that they have, while they are digging around in their teeth, they find a hidden message that is inside one of their teeth and that triggers the whole adventure. Um, it could be a mystery that something's missing from the dentist's office or there's an unknown door that you've actually never been able to get open and maybe that'll take you somewhere interesting. Um, it's espionage. Are, is there a competing dentist and and you're trying to monitor on what they're doing because you think that they're sabotaging your your uh, your practice? Um, is there something missing? Are you is there are you recovering something that's that's gone? The, the quest for the golden pick. Um, is it survival? Is it you are in your dentist's office and something goes wrong? The building starts to collapse or a fire goes off and you're just surviving. Um, science, are you trying to improve your dental practice? Um, or nurturing, are you taking care of your patients and making decisions? And so you can see how each of these choices would create a very different game, but then you look at your lighthouse, you look at your learning outcomes and you say, all right, if my learning outcomes are compound interest, which of these make the most sense? And you try to connect all that in together. And that's going to help you guide your choice. The next thing to think about with your story world is who lives there? Who are the inhabitants in that story world? Um, because these are, again, we talked about the idea of affordances. So affordances are those tools that you have to build your game out of. So you're thinking about the world, but then you also need to think about who's in that world. And what are the relationships with the player? What are their roles and goals? So these could be groups of people. So for example, in our game about uh, the dinosaur safari, we might have groups of tourists. We have the groups of dinosaurs. We might have the park employees. So all of these are different groups of people that the player may have to interact with or solve problems for. Or you can also come up with specific individuals that players will interact with. So Stanley the janitor might become a character that you continue to bring into your games. Maybe Stanley is the janitor that always gets the players out of trouble. So when the players have gotten themselves into a bad situation, Stanley shows up after hours and gives them the tool that they need to get them out of their situation. Or Dr. Emma is a veterinarian and they call on Dr. Emma when they need some help. So you can establish groups of people and you could establish specific individuals. And remember I talked earlier that this is a cyclical process. So you're gonna brainstorm things now, you're gonna ma start making your game, but then you're gonna come back and say, oh, okay, we need a dentist. And then you create a character for the dentist and that's part of your story world. And then in future episodes of, of your story, if you're gonna make multiple games, you can bring those characters back into play. 
Now, games are obstacles. Games are a, a presentation of things to make your life a little bit more difficult. That's why we play a game. We're like, you know, my life is too easy. I'd like to have my life be a little harder. Could I play a game, please, and have some artificial obstacles that I can overcome? Because that's really what, what a game is. And so at the heart of the game of the challenge is the obstacles. What's in the way? Who is creating those obstacles? Why are they there? Um, because that's going to help you make a game that is consistent. This was a failing of a lot of escape rooms early on and triggered me to write an article called Ask Why, which pushed escape rooms to think about why are these things in the way? Why am I locked in a room? Why is the code for that lock written on the wall? Why are there black lights everywhere? Um, to think about who put these in the way and then make your decisions be consistent with those obstacles. So is there who is the bad guy if there is a bad guy in the game? Um, who is the enemy of the players and what's their motivation? Um, now, it may be that there, the, it can be useful to have it where the bad guy is not an enemy of the players, but the bad guy is an enemy of someone that's asking for help from the players. That can make the game feel less personal. Um, and help you feel like I'm doing some nurturing and helping you out because you're having this problem with this other person. Or is it the environment? This is where you know climate change, a fire is going on. Is, is something happening out there and you need to deal with it? Um, or is it a group? Is it, some, is it some kind of group that you've already established? So it could be a group of, it could be a, if you're dinosaur safari, it could be a competing dinosaur safari owner and his henchmen on, they all dress up as your tour, as tourists to your park and you've got to figure out who they are. Um, are there multiple groups that are fighting? Do you find out that there's three groups that are all fighting each other and you're kind of in the middle of it? What's going on with that? So this is where you want to think about who is living in your story world. Then you want to think about who the ally is. So the, it's important in these games to have an ally. Now, the ally is the person that they have a, several important roles. First, they typically will be the person that sends the players on the quest. They are going to be the ones that – because this allows you to get away from – if I'm doing something because I want to do it, then in the game world, I should have more knowledge about that situation. If I'm like, I want to go to that mountain, and I've been researching that mountain for years, and I know I want to go to the peak of the mountain because I'm going to have something there that I have figured out is waiting for me there, and I've figured all that out. If you tell the players this is who you are, you're going to the peak of the mountain, you've been exploring this for years, well, the players should know a lot about that mountain. There should be a lot of things that they understand. But instead, if I'm going to get the thing for an ally, I got a letter from an uncle that said, hey, I don't know who else to reach out to. Um, if you're getting this, I'm dead, and I need you to go to the top of this mountain and discover things, and here's some basic information. Then it makes sense that the players don't know everything because they haven't been researching this for a long time. Instead, they know a few things, which makes more sense and works well in this kind of game environment. The ally can also be someone that provides hints. So it could be that the uncle left some information along the way for the players to discover if they need help. Um, if the ally is alive, the teacher can role play as the ally, helping the students get back on track if they're struggling or giving them hints. Um, the ally can help make those real world connections or explore the impact of the player's decisions. Um, there is a plot device that is used sometimes in storytelling where the ally becomes untrustworthy. I would not use that plot device in these games. I don't, you don't want to create a situation where the students in your classroom no longer trust you as the facilitator to help them with the game. So if I've established I'm your ally, then all of a sudden you find out I'm a bad guy, well then you're not gonna trust anything I say. Even if it doesn't make sense that you shouldn't trust, if I'm speaking to you as a game master and not as someone in the game, you're still not gonna trust me as much. You don't want that to happen. So I suggest not using the unworth, untrustworthy ally plot device. So now that you know the story world and you have an idea of who's there, it's time to make the story beats. Now again, everything I've talked about up to now is just writing story. If you've done a creative writing class, you've done all this stuff. So there's nothing different between making it for a game uh, and making it for a story, except that one of the characters in your story is not controlled by you. <laughs> That's what makes it more challenging. The players are going to be there and you have to think about how they're gonna be a part of this because you want to have the players have some agency. You want them to feel like, feel like 
they have control over what's going on. Now, the reality is you have planned out all the possible paths for them in this escape if structure game. So they may feel like they know what's going on. The reality is they're just taking one of your previously dictated paths, but you want to give the impression of agency so the player feels like what's going on. If you want to explore that concept more in detail, I'll point you to the game, The Stanley Parable. The Stanley Parable, it's an indie game that you can find, and it is all about this idea of does the player really have agency or are they just fulfilling paths that have been previously laid out for them in games? Anyway, so when you're making the story beat, now this is for a 40 minute game. So I've boiled it down to what I have learned works. This is formulaic and it's fine because this is your first game. So it's fine to use the formulas. And then as you get better at game design, you can decide when you wanna vary from these formulas. So when I make these games, I think about three acts and there's going to be three primary story beats, one in each act. Now, if you want to make a game that's going to be longer, that might take uh, several days to play, you can have multiple story beats in an act. That is typically what happens. So if you're writing a book or a movie, then each act is a major part and within each act will be multiple scenes and within these scenes will be different story beats. So, but for this game style, I have found that this is a great place to just to start. Three acts. Act one is where the players learn who they are. So something, they do something in act one where they establish their role, they might understand a bit about their goal and they run into the conflict. Now there needs to be a conflict. There needs to be something of interest going on because if there's nothing of interest going on, well then why are we telling a story about it? So you wanna think about, well, what is the thing that is happening? What is the inciting incident that's going to get that player into the world? Act two is where the player then engages with the conflict. They start to figure out and start to resolve the conflict. They think they're making progress, but then you have the twist. Now the twist changes things up a little bit. It changes some element of the game and makes this a little bit more interesting. So I always like to have a twist there in the middle and then in Act 3, the players then move from engaging with the initial conflict to engaging with the twist, and they're able to then resolve the conflict in the third act. So those are your three acts. Start out by figuring out who you are and what you do in the world and what your challenge is. As you're resolving the challenge, then you find out that it's deeper than you thought. You go down the rabbit hole, something is different. And then in the finale, you get to wrap that up and wrap everything up together. So what is the twist? I've talked about it. Um, and again, I'm presenting you with a formula to start with and you can take it from here. So the, in the twist, something changes. So, so far you've made a lot of decisions. You've talked about who's in the world. You've talked about the genre of game. You've talked about where that world is set. You've talked about who the ally is, who the bad guy is, uh, who the player is, what is their role. With the twist, you're going to change one variable. Now you could change a lot, but that's gonna be overwhelming. And so what I like to do with the twist is I like to then go back to my brainstorms and say, what is one thing I could change to make this a little bit more interesting? So it could be that the bad guy becomes your ally, becomes an additional ally. Now you're working with the bad guy to resolve something else. And again, this is where I would not make it to where the bad guy um, turns on your original ally. You want, you want the players to have someone they can trust during the entire game. Or the place is not what you expected. So you thought you were in a dentist office and all of a sudden you're in an alien spaceship, okay? Um, or the ally goes missing and the game becomes, you're investigating a missing person. So the game might have turned from an adventure into a missing person investigation. Um, but so you wanna think about some twist and this is where I would avoid using the ally as the bad guy twist. So now that you have three story beats, you now want to tie in and make sure you can tie in the learning outcomes into those story beats. And this is where you're gonna go back and forth. Understand that this is not a fast process. So going between these three acts and learning outcomes, you're gonna hit that cyclical process here because you'll say, well, here's what I'd like to do in the story, but I can't think of a good way to tie in the learning outcome. So now I need to change what we're gonna do in the story. Also know that you could start your design from any one of the three acts. That you might say, here is the big final engagement we want to have using the learning outcome. Okay, to get to that, 
where do we start and where do we need to twist? Or you might say, oh, I've got a cool idea for a twist that will help us with the learning outcome. All right, where do we start? Where do we go to? Or you might say, here's a good starting point for our learning outcome. Okay, then what's going to be a twist to make that more interesting? And then where does it go to? And I've made games in all three ways. So it's okay to pick any of these to start with. In bringing in the learning outcome, I like to use it in three acts as well. And so in the first act, it should be a relatively straightforward challenge, about a five minute challenge to let the players learn the methods of what they're doing to help them build confidence. Usually you wanna start with something relatively easy so the players feel good about what they're doing. Then in act two, you want to have them do a more complex version of the first challenge. So they've done the first challenge and now it's gonna get a little bit harder. Act three, then the players take what they've learned after the twist and they have to apply it to a different situation. So now that's going to, because if you want them to, to learn a learning outcome with real world implications, having to take the method that they've learned, a more complex way of applying the method, and then applying the method in a different setting is going to accomplish that goal quite well because it's gonna let them see their learning outcome in different settings and used in different ways. Now again, this is just a starting point. This isn't, you shouldn't say, well, Scott, I can't figure this out exactly. It's like, well, then make adjustments. But this is just a formula to get you started on making your game. It's now time to then go back and make sure you're still in line with your learning outcomes. Because you can get this far and you can get to this point and you can have veered off of your learning outcomes and kind of forgot about them or not included some of the learning outcomes that were important to you when you began. So at this point, I suggest you return back to your learning outcomes and just have another review and say, am I hitting everything? Am I missing some elements of my learning outcomes? What if I go back and look like with the global proficiency framework where you have these different levels? What happens if I look at a different level? Is there something that I can learn here? Is there some way I can improve my game? But realize this is part of that cyclical process. It's like, here's the story concepts. Here's how I can bring in some learning outcomes. Did I include all the learning outcomes? Or have I missed something? All right, I've missed something. Okay, now where do I insert something in the story to allow me to pick that up? And so it's the cyclical process, but this is an excellent point to go back and just make sure you're still pointing at the lighthouse. You're still on track delivering the learning outcomes. Now it's time to make the challenges. Now at this point, if you have not been following along um, and doing your own work and pausing after each one, I would suggest to stop my stop me now and go and start to fill out the worksheet because you, you really want to have thought about the story world, the roles of the players in the story before thinking about the challenges. Why? Because this is how you make a better educational game. So many bad educational games have been created over the years because people start with the challenge. They start with lasers shooting frogs and those lasers do multiplication before saying, well, what's the story? What's going on here? How does this all fit together? How do you avoid having the Dr. Evil's labyrinth where you will face the Minotaur of linear algebra who will ask you linear algebra questions to proceed? We don't wanna make that. We wanna make things that make sense. So now that you have some affordances where you have a story, you understand where that story needs to go, now you're gonna fit the challenges into the story and you'll have a much better chance of having a game which helps the players get involved with the story as well as in doing the challenges. Now making challenges, if you're a teacher already, this is going to be easy for you because you've been doing this. This is where you're going to have the students do the things which explore the learning outcome. So these are where if you've been doing word problems or story problems already in your teaching, it's the same concept. That's what these are. But those story problems are now designed to help convey a larger story. They're designed to fit within each other. And that's the, that's the place where it's different, where rather than having three independent story problems, you have problems that tell a story as they engage with them because that helps to build the motivation of the learners. They wanna be involved with what's going on. So this is where these challenges, you want to create them to help the players think about their role. Most importantly, though, you want them to help the players realize how they could use these learning concepts in the real world. And then you're going to build those challenges out of what's in the environment 
that you've created for the game. Now, if you're building a challenge and you realize, oh, I'm making a challenge and I need to use um, false teeth and I haven't introduced false teeth into the game yet, make a note because this means that later on we'll talk about how you round out the game. You need to make sure that false teeth get put into your world at some point. So if you need an affordance for a specific challenge, you need to make sure that, that, that you make a note to yourself so that you can make sure that's available for you to tap later on. And that's an important part of the documentation that you do when you're building these challenges. Most importantly though, you wanna make sure that each challenge matters. You wanna make sure the players feel like what they're doing will make a difference. If I'm doing a challenge, but I don't feel like that challenge is going to matter at all to the story or to anything, I'm not going to be as interested in doing the challenge. So you want to make sure that each challenge that you do matters and also is aligned with the learning outcome. You could create challenges and say, well, Scott, why can't we just do challenges for fun? Well, here's the thing. The challenges are going to be the most time consuming part of the game. Your challenges will take half of your game time is doing these challenges. Well, you want to make sure that the half of your game time that you're using on the challenges leads towards the learning outcome. You can use the other half of the game time for your story and more fun sort of things, but you want things that are gonna take some time for the players to do should be leading towards the learning outcome. Things that do not take a lot of time should not. So in uh, an example I gave earlier where I said, do you wanna pick the left door or the right door? If that was your choice, if that's not learning outcome related, which it probably is not, I'm not going to spend a lot. I'm not going to say get into small groups and talk about which door to take because that's going to take up time. And it's not leading us toward a learning outcome for something like that. I'd say, do you want the left door or the right door? Pick one. Everyone raise their hand and we move on. So you want to spend a little bit of time in the game on challenges and activities that aren't related to learning outcomes, saving the bulk of the time for the challenges that are related to the learning outcomes and for the reflection about the real world outcomes of those challenges. <clears throat> so how do you make a challenge? So, and this is like, if you're, if it was an escape room design, it would be, how do you make a puzzle? Same idea. You know from your story world where you want the player to start. You know where they are when they start. You need to think about what do they know about the world around them and what do they not know? Because it's the not know that they're going to have to figure out because the player needs to get to a finish. So they, you have a place where the player starts and then you know where the player needs to be to finish, what their goal is, and how do they know they've hit that goal? That's something to always think about. Make sure the player knows when they have solved the puzzle or accomplished the challenge. Even if they don't know if they have the right answer, in this sort of challenge, they might not know that yet until you call people to ask them the answers, but at least they know that they have done the whole process and believe they are finished. And then the process to fill in that unknown to get from start to finish, that's where the learning outcome happens. And that's it. That's what you're doing in a challenge. You're establishing and you've established in your story, here's where they start. You, you know in your story, here's where they're going because you already put together your three acts so you know this. And then the thing in the middle going from start to finish is the activity they're doing to connect where they were to where they need to go. And that should be the thing where they use the learning outcome. And that's, that's how you make a challenge. This is not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> Understand that this is going to be a cyclical process that you're going to go through and try it and try it again and try it again and figure out how to make it simpler, where you need to add more information. When you make a challenge, it's going to be too hard. It always is the first time it's too hard. So you need to figure out how do you make it easier? How do you start the player, give them more steps ahead? Or how do you make the goal move closer to them? Or how do you make the, the give them more tools to accomplish the process? Uh, for example, if you were making a game about compound interest and you wanted the players to figure that out, you might provide them with a table to fill out to figure out the compound interest rather than just saying, figure it out for five years. That's a tool that's going to make it easier for them to make that path. Um, you could say, I'm going to work out the first year for you. That moves the start up a little bit. That also gives them some examples to work with. And I'd like to do that. I like to help the players out by giving them a worked example or working out part of the problem and then letting them go from there to figure out because that helps those students that might not understand the learning outcome to see how it's applied and then they're going to continue to apply it at least for the first challenge i like to do that kind of thing 
So now it's time to add choices. So we've talked about three challenges. You've brought in your three challenges, and now you want to think about having choices. So now the choices help you to flesh out the game. If there are elements of the learning outcomes you haven't addressed, then you could use the choices to bring those in. Or if there are affordances that need to be part of the game, you can use choices to bring them in. You can use choices to help the player get more engaged with what they're doing. But you wanna be careful because if you add too many choices to the game, you can get overwhelmed. So let's say at the beginning of the game, you gave the players two choices and then you continued. Now from that point on, you're having to create two different games. And then let's say you hit a spot and you give the players two more choices. Well, now you're having to create three different games and that can really get out of hand if you're not careful. And our trick with doing that as game designers is to have a structure like you see here where the players get a choice, they step apart from each other and see the impact of that choice, but then they go back together in the primary storyline. In this case, if we're gonna have those three acts, my recommendation is that no matter what path of choices the players take to get to it, they're all back together at the same time at the next act because that makes your life as a designer better. It also ensures that you're not having to play test as many different things. The acts are the more most important challenges because that's where the learning outcomes are brought about. And if you have multiple challenges, you're gonna have to make sure that one, all the challenges test and they're all good and they all work. And two, all the challenges address the learning outcomes. So it's as a designer, my recommendation for you at this stage in your design is try to make sure that if you have a choice, then it branches and comes back and it branches and comes back. Now at the end of the game, you could have a choice that would lead to two different endings. That would be fine because that's not gonna result in a large branching structure after that. But when you're thinking about your choices, first, you want to make sure the choices are meaningful. If I say, do you want to wear your red shirt or your blue shirt, and that makes no difference in the game which shirt I put on, then I don't want to put that in as a choice because players will see right through that. They will then not trust what they're doing in the game. So you want to think about how whatever choice there is will make a difference. So if you say you want to wear the red shirt or the blue shirt, and then later on that matters because you're in a red room or a blue room and it's easier to hide if you wore the colored shirt that mattered or whatever, um, you want the players to feel like their choice had some impact. I like to avoid having clear right and wrong choices. Instead, I like to think about consequences. So rather than saying, oh, you chose the blue shirt, that's wrong. Instead, there's gonna be a consequence. And when I design, I like to make it such that each choice has benefits and consequences. So there's not a, what's the winning choice to make here? Every choice is a different choice and it just leads you down a different path or opens up different opportunities for you. But make it so that it's not, you're not trying to win the game by making all the right choices. And you can tell the players that up front. If they're really upset about a choice, you can say, listen, in this game, you're gonna have some choices, but understand that there's not one choice that lets you win the game. Each choice just has consequences. And you want to think about how do you help the player understand the potential of those consequences. So for example, in one of my games, I gave the player an opening choice of that it's you're going out to work at the dinosaur safari. It's going to be a warm day. You can choose to wear a short sleeve shirt, which will help you with the temperature, but may expose your skin to brambles or other threats. Or you can wear a long sleeve shirt which is gonna be warmer, which could cause you problems with the heat, but you will be more protected if you end up in a threatening environment. Which would you like to do? Now there, the player has a little information about what the impact is, is going to be of their choice. They don't know everything, but they can then talk about it and say, well, what do we wanna do here? And they could say, oh, well, I know when I go, like myself, when I go out and garden, if I'm gonna go garden in the raspberries and they've got bristles, it's, it's hot, I'm gonna wear long sleeves anyway, because I wanna protect my arms. Now, that type of choice creates a variable. And I like to use variables in these games because it helps the players feel like they have agency. So if the player said, we're gonna wear a long sleeve shirt, I would write on the board, long sleeve shirt. That's setting a variable. So it's just like programming. It's just like in a computer program where you'd set that variable long sleeve shirt. And then later on in the script, you would have the statement that says, if the players wore a long sleeve shirt, then, read this section or go to section seven. If the players are wearing a short sleeve shirt, go to section eight. And that's how you do it. Now you can choose to either have that happen immediately 
So in this case, that would be a variable that would happen later in the game. But you could also say, do you choose the left door or the right door? And that's going to take you to two different paths immediately to one of two different choices. But then the idea is that you want both doors to come back together, but perhaps they get different information in each side, or they meet different allies, or they engage with the story in a different way. Um, I don't like to set up punishment in, the, in these games. I, I want to avoid that concept of punishment because that's going to create negative feelings towards the game, especially if it's something where they're doing the learning outcome and then they get punished for doing the learning outcome. You definitely don't want to have that sort of situation. So that's how I do my choices is I either have an immediate story implication of what they've done or I set a variable so that later on we'll return to that variable and they'll see the implication of what their decision was. Now that variable could also be something like, um, do you pick up the fishing pole, yes or no? And if they pick up the fishing pole, you write, you have a fishing pole. So you can play off of old adventure game tropes using choices in the same way and have those variables be the things that they're collecting along the way. So now it's time to round out the narrative. So at this point now you should have your three big challenges. You should have a few choices that would support those challenges that would let the players feel like that they're in getting into the role. And now you want to round it out. So you want to make sure that you're tying in the learning outcome to the real life use. So you want to think about how do you make sure that connection is happening. If it's not, then you go back and look to see where could I add another challenge or modify a challenge or where could I add a choice that would help the player make that connection between the learning outcome and how it's being used in the game world and eventually how it's being used in the real world. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about having an onboarding choice. The idea is that the starting thing you do gets you engaged in your role. So if you're deciding what clothes to wear, you're thinking about what am I going to do as someone working on a dinosaur safari? What's that first choice going to be? How do I get involved? If that first choice is not directly related to the learning outcome, I, I, use, I do it very quickly. I, I probably may only use a couple minutes of game time to do it, but it's enough to get the players immersed in their world and in their role. Or you could do something physical. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The idea that Escape games, one thing that's different with those is there's physical activities that people uh, people get engaged with. The other thing to check now is to make sure that you have put into the game the affordances that you need for your challenges. That if you said you're going to have a challenge that's going to use frogs, that earlier in the game, frogs have already been introduced. So it's not a surprise when it's like, oh, by the way, you have frogs now. So you want to make sure that the the affordances that you need for your challenges have already been set in play. The, the parts are there. The players then will feel natural. Why are we dealing with frogs? Oh, well, because we had to make these choices around frogs and frogs became important at that point. So that's what this is good for is to make sure that all your affordances are in place before you get to the challenges. So physical activities. Now these can be really useful. I like to use physical activities midway in the game. Uh, you can open with a physical activity, but it's not as effective. And the reason why is because shifting to a new activity in the class already gets your learners excited. They're interested in what's going on. But then if they're like, oh, well, all we're doing is figuring out compound interest and we're figuring out this puzzle and that puzzle, well, then their interest might wane a bit. And so that's where I like to have somewhere around act two or three, a physical activity to get them up and moving and engage with the world. Now, we're talking about games for low resource classrooms, so these physical activities shouldn't involve anything more than found objects, but you can do a lot with role playing and found objects. There's a few ways to do it. So you can either set up that physical activity ahead of time before the game starts, so they may notice these things are around the room, but they're not going to think anything of it until the activity starts. Or you could have a surprise. So uh, I had one game where it said you're going to put these things in a box and at the start of the physical activity, throw the box, empty it into the room and let them go and search, for example. Searching is a pretty simple physical activity. Go and find all of this. So this rock is uh, something you're looking for. You need to find as many as you can in three minutes. Go. And you may have hid them around the room. Now, here's a little trick. If the number of things they find is important, so let's say you're doing a math game and they need to find 16 things and you've hidden 16 things, they're going to go out and start searching for these things. And they might not find all 16 
What you're going to do is you're going to collect them all yourself and you're going to count them yourself where they can't see you counting and you're going to come up with the number that you need to come up with, which might be 16 or whatever. That's a trick as a game master you do. You're going to manipulate reality in order to ensure that the number you come out with is the number that you need to engage with your challenges. Now you could roll with it. So let's say you're supposed to have 16 and you only find 10. You could say, well, let's, we're just going to do it with 10. But that means you are going to have to, as the facilitator, make Make sure that 10 fits into the puzzles that come up. So the easier way is just to cover it up, to collect whatever they found, and give them the number that they need in order to make sure the game goes on appropriately. Um, if you want, don't want to do searching, you could do something that's related to the role that they have in the game. Uh, so they may, if it's an espionage game, maybe they have to sneak and you're the guard and you say, you have to sneak by me and you have to get to that point without being seen. And if you're seen, then I'm going to send you back and someone else tries. Or hiding. It's like everyone has to find a place in the room to hide. I'm going to be coming in as the guard looking for you. Or they're throwing something or they're building something. So try to think, is there something physical that we can do in the game that's going to map to our roles and goals and be something that's a little bit of a break from just answering questions and solving problems? You could also do a role-playing activity. That's something that's in a lot of these games where you as the teacher are going to role-play the security guard and the players have to figure out what to say to, to get past the security guard, for example. That may or may not work in your classroom based upon your students and your engagement with them. You could also have an observation activity. So this is where you've set something up ahead of time somewhere else and you send the players out to say, now you need to go down to classroom five and look at what's there, don't touch and observe this or that or whatever. You've set something up ahead of time. Or you're just having them go somewhere in the building to look at something that's already there to look for some certain details and then come back with that information. You can do activities where there's communication, where certain people can see something and they have to talk about it to other people and then describe it. So there's a lot of physical activities to do, but I like to put in a short and optional physical activity because not all classrooms will work with physical activities. And this is where I talked about earlier, you need to know for how many people you have. So if you're doing a searching activity, if they're looking for five things and you've got 10 people, that's one thing. If they've got 300 people and they're looking for five things, that may not work out. I tend to use formulas. I will say, all right, for every 30 people in the class, you're gonna hide five more things something like that to let people find what's going on. And then you can still use your adjusting reality trick to uh, resolve it at the end. So now that you have your idea, your onboarding, you have filled in your gaps with choices, it's useful to make a diagram of your game. So this, and it doesn't have to be done in a computer, you could just do it in paper and pencil, but this helps you lay out what's going on just to make sure that you have in your mind how are things going to connect together. So you start with your onboarding, then act one challenge. You may offer the players an item, act two challenge, then they have a choice of paths, a physical activity. Uh, because the next step you're going to do is start to write the document. And when you write the document, you've got to have paragraph numbers for everything. And if you have made a diagram like this, you can then number each box to figure out what your paragraph numbers are going to be. So this tool is really useful in actually writing out the document just so you're sure you account for everything that's going on with your paragraph numbers. The final thing you want to think about is the reflection and that final activity. And this is where the learning happens. Um, Dewey, who is a, a, an educational theorist, talked about that we actually learn stuff by doing stuff and reflecting about that stuff. That's where the learning happens, is you do and you think about what you've done and that's where you, you learn. Because if you just do, 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 but you don't step back and reflect upon it, the learning doesn't happen. Because in many cases, our story is going to have the players doing something that isn't a direct real world application, like, uh, the, but they'll be doing something that you could connect to it, that's where the reflection happens. So you may not actually be making food for dinosaurs, you may be cooking, and in a reflection, that's where you have the players think about, well, what were you doing in the game? And then where might someone do that in the real world? So the path that I like to take is to say, okay, where in the game were you doing the learning outcome? So where in the game were you calculating compound interest or using fractions? Where did that happen? And what did you do and how did they help you do things in the game? So make their connection between the learning outcomes and what they did in the game. Then you ask the question, all right, how in the real world might you use that? 
and you get them thinking about situations in the real world where they'd use that same learning outcome. I like to focus that into careers to talk about in what careers would you need to know how to do these things in or around the house. When might you need to do this? When might your parents need to do this thing? You want to create every possible path that they might have that aha between what they're doing in the class and the real world. You want to seed that out. And so doing that path, and, and you want this to come from the learners rather than you tell them. You could tell them, oh, well, here's what you should have learned, and then here's what you should have learned, but that's not nearly as effective as having them have the aha, because many times they're going to come up with something you never would have thought of. And that's where you get to have an aha. Uh, now, if you're making a story world and you're going to be making another game out of the world, a fun thing to do right now is to ask the players, what do you think is going to happen next? And get their ideas. Because that's going to give you lots of ideas. That'll give you an idea of what sort of things they might get excited about for the next game and gets them thinking as a designer. What, what's going to happen next in the story world? It also seeds the thinking for later on in the class when you might have an end of class project to say, now you're all going to make an escape if game or you're going to make one challenge for a game. So I've done it where we think about the overarching story and then we assign each group a challenge. You're going to do act one challenge. This is what, So you're going to do act two, you're going to do act three and you put that all together. Uh, when I did this in an escape room class, the way I did it as a class, we came up with the overarching story and the story beats. I then split the students into groups and I had three groups designing a challenge for each story beat. Then they all presented their challenges back to the rest of the class and the class voted on which challenge they liked the best for the story beats. And then we patched that all together into one big game. So those are two ways to get your learners involved to either have them make their own entire game or to assign them with specific story beats that they're going to make one challenge for. Because if you make a challenge around a learning outcome, you're learning how to teach that challenge. And that really cements what's going on. Now it's time to write your document. So you've been thinking about things, you've got some pieces, but now it's time to actually write the scripts. Again, go to escapeif.com if you need to see some sample scripts. You'll also find some templates there that you can work with to uh, help you get go faster in making your scripts. So I always like to start by writing up the challenges first. Uh, those are the hardest ones to write up. They're also the most important part. They also, as I write up a challenge, I may realize, oh, I've made a mistake. I need to add this, or I need to make sure that this piece is in earlier. So by writing up the challenges first, it's going to help me realize if I've missed some things uh, along the way. I always make it to where anything that's in bold is something the teacher says. Anything that's in italics is something the teacher does. That's the standard that I use for writing up these games. And again, you can just follow the scripts that they're all there in the Creative Commons. So you can take a script and then just replace it with your own text. I then, after I come up with the challenges, I will make my game flow diagram where I number the squares. So I'll, I'll write out each of the uh, each of the major areas and then number each square because the, the numbered squares are going to be the numbered paragraphs. So this is going to help me start to assign numbers to each section. I then start at the start of the document and I write the onboarding activity number one and then I say might say uh, and I try to make one numbered section be like a scene in in a in a movie so I'd have the onboarding activity to be scene one then at the end I'd say go to entry two entry two might be the first choice here's the choice if they choose a go to entry three if they choose b go to entry four then I write up entry four and entry three then at the end of both of those entries it might say go to entry five so that's going to bring everyone back together and entry five might be my act one challenge etc but if you've done the game flow diagram and you've numbered all of the major parts then it's easy to create your numbered paragraphs um, and you spend a lot less time going back and fixing the numbers because you made a mistake only then when I've written out the whole game, do I then write the reflection at the end and then go back to the start and write the overall summary. I like to have a summary for the teacher to read, to understand the basic game flow. That's important, but I write that last. I don't write that first. Then it's important to start testing the game and I test it by myself first. I read it out loud because when you read things out loud, many times you'll hear things that you didn't hear when you wrote it down. And I, I use what's on the paper I don't use my assumptions about what's on the paper. I read what's on the paper. 
Um, and, and then I follow the choices and I try to make sure that all the choices are numbered correctly. And I've always made a mistake. I've always messed something up and then I have to go back and fix the numbers. But you only find that by reading what you wrote. And that takes us into the most important part. Everything's the most important part, but the most important part of, of making a game is play testing the game. It's not just, I made the game, I'm done, let's run it with the class. You need to play test it, especially in these kind of puzzle-based games. And, and the maze, you will find that most of the time your game is too hard and will take too long. That is what we find when we make these kind of games. And it's because when you're writing out the game and the challenges, you have in your head what everything should be, what should be happening. You understand the situation, but the players don't. It's all new to them. So it's overwhelming. So it's going to be difficult. So you need to realize that. And the only way you'll see that is by testing the game on people. And when you test the game, read it from the script. Don't improvise. Don't say what you think it is. Read what's in the script. Try to run it just like a teacher would run it because you'd be amazed to find out what you left out. <laughs> there will be things that you left out of the script that you had in your head to write down, but you didn't write down. And you're only going to find that out by actually testing the game with people. And then you'll see if the learners can solve your challenges or if they need more information or if they're stuck. Listen very carefully to what they ask questions about and figure out how could I resolve that? How could I make it so that people can be more successful? Generally, I like to make it to where the first act challenge takes five minutes, the second act challenge takes five to seven minutes, and the third act challenge takes seven to ten minutes. That's about 20 minutes, and that leaves me 20 minutes in the game for onboarding, for my choice, for my physical activity, and then another 20 minutes at the end for the reflection. So that's how I like to time all of this out. If your challenge is too hard, you have a couple tricks. You can solve some of the puzzles for them and help them see how to solve it. You can remove stuff that's getting in the way. Don't put in red herrings. You have enough red herrings in the game. Don't put in things that aren't going to help them out. Um, you can write in hints that the teacher can give if the players are struggling, but I tend to not want to do that. I want to let the players feel that sense of success, but sometimes they are just gonna struggle. And then you wanna make sure that you're applying that, that you will check one more time to make sure you're hitting the learning outcomes and they're being applied to the real world situations. And then in the reflection, they're reflecting that back into what's going on. Now, so far we've been talking about how to make these games for low resource classrooms, classrooms with just a chalkboard and found objects. You can, you can add things to them. You can add other elements if you'd like. I would recommend that the base game you create is something that anyone can run in a low resource classroom because that's the goal is to create these games such that we can share them and that people can run them in their low resource classrooms and any and but if you add additional assets you could make them optional additional assets could be a worksheet for example so if you were making a game that had some relatively complex mathematics you could create a worksheet that the players can use to assist them in making sure what's going on. So one of the games I made, which was for high grade levels, was designed around mean and median and mode. And there were times where the players had to figure out the mean, the median, and the mode of a fairly large data set. So you write all the numbers on the board and the players figure these things out. Having those on a worksheet would help the players to be more successful because they wouldn't be relying on copying everything down. But they aren't going to, you're not always going to have disposable paper and worksheets around. So I didn't want to rely upon that, but I could include it as an option. Audio can really help the players get into a mood. So if I was making a dinosaur safari game, I might use a certain theme park sound to get them engaged with what's going on. It can really help with that onboarding process, but I would not run the same two minute song on loop for the whole 40 minutes. That will drive people batty. So use music, if you're gonna use music, use it infrequently, use it to indicate a change of act, use it to indicate a big thing, use it to set a mood, but don't have the same thing playing again and again. And some students will not be able to focus if you've got music playing. So I would avoid having music. Don't play the Jeopardy theme when they're doing their challenges, <laughs> for example. Um, let that, so I would suggest having the challenges be quiet. Use music if you want to, to try and get people excited or sound effects, um, but they shouldn't be running all the time. 
Um, you can use digital whiteboards and uh, draw out pictures of what's going on ahead of time and then just call it up or prepare like a PowerPoint presentation where you just call things up on a slide. But I find that if you do that, you might lose some of the magic of the game appearing in front of the student's eyes because then they really think, oh, this is all created ahead of time. While if it's on the board and things are, you're writing the variables, oh, you're wearing long sleeve clothing and it does this, then that's gonna make the, make the game a little bit more magical for the students because they are part of the co-creation process. You could use all of this to make a digital game. And in fact, making escape if games is the first step. This is a step of making a branching narrative and a story is what you have to do before you're gonna make any kind of a narrative-based game. That the students, uh, if you wanna teach the students programming down the road, they could do this first because this is teaching variables. This is teaching if then. This is teaching how to write a story because you're gonna build the game around that story. Because what I find what happens is if you give students uh, a computer tool to make a digital game, Many times the first thing they will do is figure out how to kill things with it. How do I shoot someone? How do I do that? And then they slump the story on top of it and then it doesn't make any sense. So you wanna start with the story and the sorts of challenges you want. You do the planning first, then you figure out what do I need to program in order to make the plan. You could use Google Forms or you could use Twine, which is a free tool to take and make a digital version of the game, but that's gonna lose a couple really important things about EscapeF. The first thing it's gonna lose is the students talking to each other. A lot of the magic in an escape if game happens when the students have that time to engage directly with each other, to talk with each other about what's going on, to make decisions about what's happening, and then see what happens. If they're all sitting at their own computers and they're not talking to each other, then they're gonna be focused on winning the game. Especially if they all start at the same time, they're gonna be racing, and these games, don't do a lot if you're just racing to just get the right answer. What's the right answer? I just want to pick something. Just click, click, click and skip. Um, instead of having a, a forced march through the game experience where we're all going to do it together, I know that the students are all going to have five minutes to talk about this thing and not just say, let's just make a choice and move on because they're going to be sitting there for five minutes and they know they're going to have five minutes to work on this thing. So they have that time to talk about it. It creates more time for the students to engage as compared to blow right through it. Because if these games were made, if you took a, an escape if game that took 40 minutes in the classroom with communication, discussion, debate, and, and turned it into a, an online experience, it might take you 10 minutes to blast through it and you're not gonna have the same impact. So having those group discussions is an important part of the escape if experience. The other piece that's really important is that if it is done through a script, the teacher can change the game. They can make changes as the game is running because they are making the reality come to life by what they say, but what they write on the board. If it's all in a digital spreadsheet or a Google Doc or a Twine document, it's gonna be a lot harder for the teacher to make changes. They may not be able to make changes at all, or they certainly might not, they won't be able to make changes while the game is running. And doing it as a storytelling based game, the teacher has the ability to adapt the game as it's running to better adapt to the classroom. And that's an important feature of these games. So while you can create a digital version of these games, know that they are most effective when the players have the time to discuss things, to make decisions together, and the teacher has the ability to adjust what's going on. So you've written a game, you've written a script, you've play tested it, you've run in your classroom, it's working, now what? Now we ask you to give back. Just like we've created all of these resources for you to make a game, now we'd like you to share your game with others. So the M Education Alliance um, will is created a repository for games. And the idea is that you can create your game and then you can put it into the Creative Commons just like everything else has so far and then upload it to allow other teachers to be able to use your game and to and to progress. I'm really excited about the possibility of having games that are created around stories that are from a culture shared with other people. I would love to see and learn about stories that your students are excited about. So getting your students to create stories based upon their own view of the world and then share those stories through these uh, through this repository. And this is where this goes is my hope is that by putting everything you've seen in the Creative Commons by making it all freely available will encourage people 
to make scripts. The scripts don't require uh, a lot of stuff to run. You don't have to have anything specific to run the game. So that's the goal of what we want to do with this project. So hopefully you'll be inspired to share your scripts, to have your students share their scripts with everyone else through the M Education Alliance. <clears throat> and with that, I am going to thank you for spending some time. Hopefully you can make some games and get some games out there. Um, Keep up with EscapeIf at EscapeIf.com. That's where I'll be putting more design tools and worksheets and everything that you need will be there. And feel free to share this with others because my hope is that by lowering the barricade to playing games and to making games, we can get more people engaged with the game experience. So thank you much and good luck. Bye-bye.